eventually somebody's going to run into some serious solvency issues with this stock. At some point, somebody's bill is overdue. Somebody must provide the shares. They must make their delivery. And if they do not make their delivery, they face massive monetary fines for failing in their duty as a market maker. And this is what I suspect is happening right now with Troika is somebody just got called. Hello everybody, my name is Drew Demon and I'm the Devil's Stockbroker. In this video, I'm going to be covering some technical analysis on one of our most recent short squeeze plays, Troika Media, ticker symbol TRKA, as well as a couple of other short squeezes. And in this video, I'm also going to touch on a bit of a complicated subject having to do with short exempts and trying to explain them using these tickers as a prime example of how rehypothecation occurs in certain stock tickers and how this enables market makers, broker dealers, and other financial institutions to continue lending shares that otherwise cannot be located, i.e. do not exist. This is essentially going to break down naked shorting, the way it's done, and how the cycle perpetuates. Without further ado, let's get into it. So let's get into some technical analysis starting with Troika Media. So Troika, as many of you are probably already aware, this is a ticker that I called out as being subject to a potential liquidity squeeze that has to do with short exempts and shorting in general. There's a subtle difference in short squeezes versus a short liquidity squeeze in that short squeezes typically occur when shorts experience enough pain from price action moving against them that eventually results in shorts deciding collectively to evacuate their positions as a collective. And that causes the price action where you see the stock going up and up and up in a meteoric fashion. A short liquidity squeeze happens for slightly different reasons. It is also because price action is moving against short positions, but specifically with a short liquidity squeeze, there is a problem with actually locating short shares and lendable shares. And this specifically affects market makers and broker dealers. First, I want to explain the relationship with this. Um, but let's actually take a look at what happened with Troika very recently. So if we go down to the five minute chart here, we can see that Troika had a really amazing move that happened earlier this uh, last week, actually, I should say, where it made a giant uh, pop between Friday, February the 17th and Tuesday, February the 21st in pre-market, and then came straight back down and then started moving up throughout the remainder of Thursday and Friday on February 23rd, 24th, and then that same Monday, Tuesday, uh, the very next week. Now, throughout this entire period, short exempts were very high, and there was speculation that shorts were getting pushed out. However, if you actually look at the Ortex data, you will very quickly notice that throughout this meteoric move, Troika short, uh, short interest was actually climbing at an almost exponential rate. At this point, as of today, March 1st, 2023, Troika's estimated short interest percentage of the free float is 106%. The live estimate puts it as high as 109% meaning that more than 100% of the free float has been lent out and sold short as a borrowed stock. So now we're confirmed that there are more shares in the float than what should exist, because essentially a single short creates a rehypothecation of a share, especially if that share moves into the market more than once. Now, what do I mean by rehypothecation? Rehypothecation occurs when you have an institution. We will call this institution Bank One. Now, this institution has a share of Troika. Bank Two wants this share. They want to borrow this share because they have somebody who wants to buy it from them. So they 
mark this share as borrowed. And then bank one says, okay, you can have this share, give it back to us once you're done with it, and we'll be square. Bank two then takes this share and lends it out to customer. And then this person receives their share of stock. Now, this is the essential shorting process. This is how short borrows or shares are lent out from one institution to the next. In a different scenario, this is actual rehypothecation. This occurs when a share is lent out multiple times in a form of a daisy chain. Essentially, you have bank one, which holds on to a share and gives it to its first customer. This customer then offers up this share for lending. When this customer lends out their share, bank two receives this share, who then sells that share to their customer, who then lends it out for short selling to bank three, who adds it to their inventory and provides that share. They sell it into the market to a third customer. This is all the same share. Essentially, this share has been lent out, sold into the market three separate times. And essentially, you have two copies of the same share being held as marked by these two individuals that are circled in the market. Now, where this becomes a problem is say that individual number two goes insolvent or they get margin called. This person then needs to return that equity back to the first customer because the bank is demanding it. So the first person must give back their share because they have gone insolvent. This forces the person to call bank number three, who then forces this person to cover. And this is where rehypothecation can become dangerous because this can occur in the market an unlimited number of times. There's actually no theoretical limit to the number of times that rehypothecation can occur. And because of that, you have this situation where individuals who go insolvent cause everybody at every point after them in the daisy chain to be forced to return their shares of stock if there is no other location to get it from. Now, what does this look like when institutions do it? We have three separate banks or brokers. Broker number one has a requirement for, we'll say, 100,000 shares. So they need 100,000 shares in order to be able to supply their inventory of customers and uh, meet their demand. So what bank number one does is they make a request to borrow those shares from bank number two. Bank number two looks into its inventory and says, hmm, I only have 10,000 shares. And they can give a call to bank number three, who is able to supply them with an additional 90,000 shares in order to bring them whole. So bank two calls up bank three, bank three delivers the 90, bank two delivers 100,000 shares. And then this supplies bank one's market. Now, this is only the first step in the chain. What happens when bank number three then gets a call from a customer who really, really wants 100,000 shares, like right now? Well, bank number three, if they can't give those shares to this individual, then they're going to be out that money. And that would have been a sale that they could have made otherwise, but they don't have the shares anymore. So how are they going to supply those shares? Well, they call up bank number one. Bank number one says, oh, hey, I happen to have this inventory of 100,000 shares. So they send it all the way back to bank number three. And we've created what is essentially just one big cycle of shares being lent out into the market from one institution to the next. And this is a single normal cycle. There's no rehypothecation that has occurred here as of yet. But here's where things get really interesting. So bank number one is only able to lend out 50,000 shares. Because we'll say that uh, 50,000 went to their customers. 
So bank one only has 50,000 shares to give back to bank number three. So they say, okay, we'll supply you with the 50,000 shares, um, but that's all we can do. We can't do anymore. That's it. Bank number three is a broker dealer or a market maker. So we can actually designate them differently as a market, uh, market dealer or a market making broker dealer. Good example of this would be Citadel Securities. Citadel Securities acts as a market maker. They're actually the largest market maker in the United States. And this is something that they frequently do, uh, along with most other market makers, because they have special status. Um, so you could say the same of Susquehanna or um, Wolverine Capital. All of these different market makers that exist in the market are able to use what is called a short exempt. Short exempt. So short exempt is a special case. Short exempt is essentially a short, which is exempt from two rules in the reg show, which is regulation short, which is managed by the SEC. That's the Securities Exchange Commission. A short exempt is reserved only for legitimate broker dealers or market makers in the stock market or special cases when they are unable to locate a share and or when they must provide a short in order to make a market during a downtick while a stock is on the short sale restriction list. Short sale restriction list is a special case where if a stock drops by more than 10% in a single day from its previous day's close, you're not allowed to short it during a downtick when the price is moving down. This is supposed to prevent a dogpiling effect, but a market maker has special status, so they get to short during a downtick if they are making a market, and then they mark that trade as short exempt. And the purpose of this is to provide liquidity to the market. This is a legitimate use for it. However, if it is abused, then it can actually perpetuate the dogpiling effect that we speak of when we're looking at these different types of cases. So we're back to uh, we're back to Bank Three now, and we already mentioned that they borrowed fifty thousand legitimate shares from Bank One. As it turns out, they're borrowing in a big cycle, but doesn't really matter. All they care is that they are getting shares from somewhere, as long as the positions in the Daisy Chain are marked somehow. Now, what happens between Bank Two and One? Bank Number Three has no knowledge of what happens between Bank Two and Three. Bank one has no knowledge of what happens between bank one and three. Bank two has no knowledge of. So none of these banks are even aware of this chain that has been created. Now, bank number three still needs 50,000 shares in order to provide them to this customer. So in order to make this customer whole, bank three says, I cannot locate a share. So I'm going to use a short exempt to come up with 50,000 shares. And a short exempt allows the market maker or the broker dealer to say, I cannot locate the shares, so I must short exempt these shares in order to provide liquidity to the market and provide shares to my customers. When they do this, they are essentially creating a synthetic number of 50,000 shares on the promise that they will recover these shares within T plus six, that's transaction plus six trading days. These are settlement days in the market. So weekends do not count, holidays do not count, just trading settlement days. So bank number three essentially gives those 50,000 shares to their customer, the, or the, rather they get the uh, 50,000 from short exempts, they get 50,000 from bank number one, and they sell the 100,000 shares total to their individual customer. Now, we have started a rehypothecation machine because now, say we have a situation where bank number one needs those 50,000 shares back, bank number three is going to have to demand those shares from somewhere. Now, in one case, they can go to another institution and they can go and borrow some more in order to take care of that 50,000 short exempt, but what about the other 50,000 they legitimately borrowed? And bank one is asking for those back. So 
the bank might then go to bank number two and say, hey, I need 50,000 shares because I have another bank that is asking me to uh, provide those. So bank number two, guess what? Bank number two is out of shares. So they also take 50,000 shares short exempt and then pass that back bank number three. And just like that, now we have 100,000 synthetic shares floating around in the market. And you can see by the drawing, this has already gotten extremely confusing. And that's the problem with this. This entire mess, this daisy chain of lending, borrowing, synthetic creation of shares gets so convoluted so quickly that trying to unwind these positions can be extremely complicated. Now let's just go ahead and start over from that point where we left off, okay? So we actually left off at the point where essentially two different institutions have synthetically created a total of 100,000 shares. You have 50,000 that were created by bank number two, and you have 50,000 that were created by bank number three. So both of these institutions now require uh, are, are required to at some point make whole these 50,000 shares and they only have t plus six settlement days to do it that is their limit they must deliver these within t plus six days now say something interesting happens and bank number two isn't able to come up with the shares bank number three isn't able to come up with the shares like let's say that this process has gone on for so long and they've continuously been lending to each other that they're not going to be able to come up with those shares bank number two we'll say they got back their we'll say they got back their uh, 50,000 shares and they ended up not needing to use it and both bank number two and bank number three are asking for 50,000 shares in order to get these back. Well, bank number two, we'll just say that they prefer bank number, uh, or bank number one prefers bank number two. So they give bank number two the original shares that they hold. So these are legitimate shares, okay? So these are, these are legit. Bank number one gives them to bank number two. But bank number three is also asking they they say we want these shares too. We need we need fifty thousand shares. We're willing to pay a much bigger fee. We'll say we'll give you a one hundred percent fee on a borrow rate. Get these because we're due for delivery and we're gonna get fined otherwise. So we'll pay this fee in order to avoid this fine. So bank number one says, um, okay, let me go check my inventory. Um, hey, turns out I do have fifty thousand shares. From short exempts. They're not going to tell the bank that, but they're going to get another 50,000 shares and they're going to give short exempted shares to bank number three. Now, these banks have been able to settle their T plus six cycle, but they've restarted another one by doing this. So there's still 50,000 shares that need to be delivered at some point, but these now have a new T plus six cycle because of that lending process. Since it's a new transaction, this new transaction, these 50,000 shares that were short exempt, they get a new T plus six cycle. And now we get to the crux of the problem where this back and forth going to and from one bank to another, asking them continuously, like, give me shares, give me shares, give me shares, give me shares from one bank to the next just creates one big triangle or a cycle, whatever you want to call it. It's a rehypothecation machine. And this thing can snowball so quickly, especially as these transactions get complicated. And this is just between three separate parties. These are just three separate institutions. Banks have hundreds of, if not thousands of customers that are making demands of shares every single day. And all of these positions are managed electronically for the most part. Rarely does human input even come into, uh, come into play here. But the problem is that the computers have no awareness of each other's positions. These banks are totally independent of each other. And there's no way for them to actually track who is who and who owns what or who has what obligations. So 
Now I can take this example and bring you back to the issue uh, with Troika, which is in a unique position. Essentially, Troika is going through what appears to be an active squeeze here as I'm recording this video, which is, um, yeah, this is amazing. I actually wasn't expecting this move, but I mentioned that uh, today was a T plus six settlement day and now shares are massively overdue. We had a stop loss hunt yesterday, and that brings me to the point that I was going to try to make which was that uh, Troika had a massive amount of short exempts two days in a row. If you go back here, the last six trading days, short exempts were massive. Um, one day uh, at the very beginning, these are the ones that are due today. These were due by the morning bell today, was 979,000 shares that were short exempt. And they've been short exempting a ton of these every single day. And now you can see two days in a row were over 1.1 million shares short exempt. And what I suspect is happening is these institutions, these market makers, are doing this cyclical pattern of rehypothecating their own short exempts in order to continuously deliver to each other. Eventually, somebody's going to run into some serious solvency issues with this stock. At some point, somebody's bill is overdue. Somebody must provide the shares. They must make their delivery. And if they do not make their delivery, they face massive monetary fines for failing in their duty as a market maker. And this is what I suspect is happening right now with Troika is somebody just got called. Right now, Troika is moving at 47 cents and it's still climbing. I, I'm amazed. And just, I, I oh, wow. Um, holy cow. So we called this out. We called this out in the first week of February. I think we were down here on the ninth when we called this out. So we got mo most of Hell's trading floor was in at like twenty three, twenty four cents, and now we're at forty eight cents and still climbing. This is just freaking incredible. The short interest on this stock is insane. It's over one hundred percent, and it's been doing nothing but climbing continuously. Every single move to the downside has been signaled as a stop loss hunt by all of uh by all of my indicators because an institution is desperately in need of recovering these shares and this this is continuing look at how much of the free float is on loan the percentage of free float on loan is 157 percent. this is the number to pay attention to because the on loan shares are the ones that market makers are demanding that are they're borrowing from other wholesalers and institutions in order to make their customers whole and provide liquidity to the market. This is what I mean by a liquidity squeeze. There's not enough shares in the market to meet the demand right now. And that is why this is such a serious problem. IBKR availability is, I mean, it lets you know roughly how many shares are available according to interactive brokers for short selling, but it tells you nothing of the demand by institutions in order to supply their market. So whatever is going on right now in Troika Media is still going on. I expect this to continue for some time because they have gotten themselves into such a deep hole. They're going to take days digging themselves out of it. And like I'm not even worried about setting a stop loss right now because that's that's just going to end up getting people, you know, sniped and institutions snatching those shares out of your hand if you set a tight stop loss. I always advocate for managing risk, but what's happening right now and what actually happened yesterday was individuals in this ticker got stop loss hunted so badly. This single candle, which hit at about, it was uh, two, yeah, it was like, it was almost three o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And the volume on this five minute candle was 4.45 million. And they just, Oh, uh, wrong candle, 6.7 million. And they stop loss hunted the living hell out of traders here. And what they did was they scooped up all those shares and bought them all back on the very next candle. So they, they spent millions smashing this price down in order to go and pick up shares in this liquidity level right here. This was a zone of liquidity down here below the 57 cent marker where they knew there were people with stop losses that they were trying to snipe and pick those shares up. Now they're getting desperate, and that's what this means. When institutions start resorting to this stuff in order to get their shares in order to meet demand, and you can 
you can, <laughs> they did it again today. So they tried to hit it here and they started scooping up shares slowly over time throughout the day. And now, now I think that we're starting to see some, now they're being forced to go and pick up shares because there's, there's nobody that's willing to sell right now. And this can continue this kind of, this kind of meteoric movement can keep going as long as the short interest is still there, as long as the demand for lendable shares is still there, um, but there's not enough supply to meet it. So keep a close eye on this one and pay real close attention. Um, I will actually go and point out that the same exact thing has been happening on other tickers, so AMC was actually one of those. If you want to check by the numbers, uh, AMC, after its earnings call, um, Yesterday, the short exempts were over nine hundred thousand at that point too, um, and it was one one point three four million the day before they uh, they announced earnings. AMC has been getting slapped constantly with short exempts because they're not able to meet the demand in the market for it, and uh, it it's kind of funny now. AMC has got this like really solid floor on it. And I think it's because you've got institutions trying to pick up shares in order to settle these short exempts that we're talking about right now as quickly as possible. But like I mentioned, there's a T plus six cycle on these short exempts. That's the maximum amount of time that institutions are allowed to hold these positions as failures to deliver. It actually becomes a failure to deliver after the fourth day, and then they get two days to clear failures to deliver. Otherwise, they start getting fined. And that's, uh, or that's at least how the system is supposed to work. Whether it's efficient is another question entirely. But the, uh, yeah, the, the T plus six cycle is not like a hard rule. These institutions, if they get better prices to cover those positions sooner than that, they'll do it. They'll actually force the price down as quickly as they can and then scoop those, scoop up the difference and keep that profit. And they'll use that technique throughout uh, bad markets in order to actually scoop shares up. So what they end up doing is they, uh, they provide the liquidity for the market to go up, and that's what the short exempts are trying to do. It's trying to provide a bunch of shares during a market that's moving up very quickly in a way they cannot control, and then they later take a bunch of shares up at the top, smash the price down, and then they go and buy back all of these shares at this price that they were providing liquidity for like at ridiculous sums like $7.50. So they sold up here and then they bought back down here and they keep this difference. And that's almost like a 50 cent to a dollar spread. So market makers, they, they have this technique and they do this automatically, right? This is built into their algorithms. This is how they make their money. So being aware of this as retail investors is how you can protect yourself against this kind of risk. Because what these institutions are doing is they are using you for liquidity and they are targeting you to take your money. That is how they work. That is how this market functions. The more aware you are of this, the better suited you are in order to protect yourself and your capital. You want to talk about another one that's getting bludgeoned? Bed Bath & Beyond is exactly the one to be paying attention to. Bed Bath & Beyond is getting absolutely smashed with short exempts right now, and the short interest has been rising, and I suspect it's because there's speculation they're going to go bankrupt very soon. So institutions are, especially market makers, are just absolutely foaming at the mouth for an opportunity to just sell a bunch of false liquidity, just fake shares into the market, and then buy back legitimate shares at bottom dollar prices. If they can push Bed Bath & Beyond to a penny, they would, because they make so much money doing this that it just will make your head spin. They can sell virtually an unlimited number of short exempts into the market. There's no restriction in doing this. As long as they can, if an audit were to occur, which must be uh, enforced by either FINRA or the SEC, they just have to be able to justify it by saying that, oh, it was a volatile market and it was extremely unpredictable and we couldn't locate shares and our customers were making demands of us. We had to. And as long as they can say that and back it up with some documented proof, there's no restriction on the amount of short exempts that they can do. All that it says in Reg Show is that they are rare and unusual. 
that it should only be done for legitimate bona fide market making purposes during an illiquid or extremely volatile market. And we can say very easily that this is a volatile market. Any market maker can easily make this excuse. But if you go back to Bed Bath & Beyond, while it was trending downward massively, short exempts every single six days. Look, 1.2 million shares, short exempt volume. That was 9% of the total short volume from that day. Go six days later, one, two, three, four, five, six, boom. You have more short exempts. This is a rehypothecation cycle. These guys are borrowing a bunch of thin air stock, selling it into the market to smash the price down. As soon as they get control of it, or they need to go and do it again, they just print new shares. They go to another institution, get them to print new shares, and provide them with that same liquidity. And this cycle keeps repeating itself constantly throughout the market. The only thing that will eventually burn these assholes is when eventually somebody buys enough legitimate shares and removes the ability to borrow them from their portfolio i.e. turn off your god lending programs, then this will continue forever. But until you know, at the point where no more shares can be borrowed and it doesn't matter how much fake liquidity they pump into the market, eventually these guys realize that there's no legitimate shares left to borrow. So they are forced in that case just by the nature of the way the market is, which is absolutely brutally ruthless. The first institution that catches wind that this market is totally illiquid and that there are no legitimate shares available, they will start buying and they will start buying at market price at any price in order to make sure that they are not the ones holding the bag that must deliver their shares. And when multiple institutions get wind of it, then the price gets ridiculous fast. I have found that this method of determining liquidity crises in stocks has been repeatedly reliable. This method worked for AMC during the May-June squeeze of 2021, BBIG and SPRT in August and September of 2021, Progenity in October 2021, Mullen in February and March of 2022, Redbox, which occurred in the summer of 2022, Revlon's bankruptcy squeeze that occurred in the summer of 2022, all kinds of different stocks. I can go on forever with a number of stocks that we have detected these types of crises in. Bed Bath & Beyond, AMC, and Troika, which is the biggest one right now happening actively in front of my eyes, are the biggest opportunities. So I'm going to go ahead and leave this video here, and you guys can just go ahead and look at the charts for yourselves. Let the numbers speak for themselves. If you guys want to be able to get this data and analyze stocks in real time, just like I do, if you guys want to learn how to do this, we provide access to these tools. What we provide at Hell's Trading Floor is analytics tools in the form of our proprietary scourge bot that will alert the top tickers in the market on a daily basis that are suspicious or showing signs of potential liquidity crises and give you call outs in real time whenever an opportunity presents itself. If you guys want to take a look at that and get introduced to our system, you can join our Discord at discord.gg slash Hell's Trading Floor by signing up at our website at hellstradingfloor.com. If you guys like this video, if you found it useful, and if you enjoyed the content, please be sure to leave a like, subscribe so that you can get alerts whenever we do another video, and please consider joining our Discord. We would love to have you. Thank you so much for watching the video, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Until then, have a hell of a time in the markets.